and this is very much still the dominant mindset in, in neoclassical economics and, and, and economic discourse is that the more we consume, the better we are. <coughs> but Sen launched the first critique of that in the 1970s by saying that, well, our well being, our quality of life doesn't lie in what we consume, but it lies in the quality of our lives. It lies in our relationships, it lies in, in our sense of security, our sense of peace, um, it lies in our being able to be healthy, in our education, in our political participation. So the standard of living lies in the living and not in the possession of commodities. So the capability approach emerged from that critique of utilitarianism in economics. And so there are two key concepts of that approach to, um, to well-being, to conceiving of well-being. The two words that we, you need to remember is functioning and capability. A functioning are the valuable activities and states that make up people's well-being. So a functioning is what, um, what makes life worthwhile. You know, it's, it's your valuable states and, and activities, like being healthy, being educated, enjoying relationships, um, being able to you know, express in your culture, uh, living in peace, having adequate housing, and so forth. And because Sen situates himself within liberalism, what is important is not so much the state of being, but your freedom. To, to be or do what you value. <coughs> so he defines the capability, which is also now uh, understood as freedom, as a person's ability to do valuable acts or reach valuable states of beings. So the capabilities reflect the opportunities that people have to live a life they value. And just to illustrate um, the distinction, is the example of the fasting monk and the starving child. They both have the same level of functioning. They are both malnourished. But the monk has the capability to be nourished, but he chooses not to be nourished. He chooses to fast for some reasons. But the starving child doesn't have that choice. So the focus is on the capability, not on the functioning. Another example that we could we can give to illustrate that distinction between functioning and capability is of failing an exam. You have two children that <coughs> both fail an exam. But one comes from a very rich family and she has all she, she wants and she doesn't bother about studying because she knows that her parents are rich and she doesn't have to work and so she fails all her exams. But another girl, she has seven siblings to look after. She comes back from school, she has so many work to do at, in the house, she doesn't have even a table to do her, her, her housework. She wants to study, but she just can't, and she fails her exam. So both have the same level of functioning, they both fail the exam, They're, but one has the ability, she has opportunities to be well educated, but she just doesn't bother and the other one doesn't have the same opportunities. So the distinction is quite important in, 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 in many ways. And just a note about the, the vocabulary. It's, um, it's very unfortunate, this word capability, which in Spanish is capacidad, funcionalidad. Um, it's not user-friendly at all. And, um, and Sen always says that when, when he first articulated his critique of utility, he never knew that this term would, would, would take such a, such a life on its own. And this is why today he uses more the, the word freedom as a synonym for capability, because it's more understood. Um, it's, it's more easily translatable as well. Um, and um, just to clarify the distinction between the capability approach and the income approach in economics. If you think about personal heterogeneity, it's in the sense that if you give the same amount of food to, um, to a man who is working on the field, who is a farmer, or, or, um, or, a, or a man who is retired and doesn't do much, 
Well, if you did the same amount of food, they, they, they will need and um, they'll have a different outcome in terms of health. So in order for these two men to be well nourished, you will need to give much more food to the person working in the fields than the person who sits at home the whole day. So this is why he says we need to know we, incomes are not a good indicator of well-being. You need to look at the outcome. And there are also environmental diversities. Now if you if you live in, in a warm climate or if you live in Moscow, you will need a different amount of, of, of commodities and income in order to be warm and to be sheltered. There are also variations, what he says, of the social climate, the extent of public services. If you live in a country that has free education and free health services, you would need a, 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 low, a, less, a, a, um, a smaller income than in order to be healthy and educated than if you live in a country that doesn't have these public services. And there are cultural di differences as well, and then distribution within the family. And um, if you think about family income, well, where does the family income go? In some countries, the income might go to pay for the food and education of the boys and not the girls. And this is why the capability approach is very individually focused. It looks at what, um, what each individual is able to do or, or is. So it looks at the outcomes of each individual and not in terms of family. And there are also differences with the happiness literature. Um, if you, if you think about well, being happy is not the same as living a, a fulfilled uh, life or... Uh, um, and uh, there was the, the case of slum dwellers in India that reported themselves as happy as middle class students. And so some psychologists went you know, tried to research that. Why is it that, that, that people in, in slum dwelling areas are as happy as... Um, as a, as a middle class students, and um, and so if you look, if you <coughs> stop at the level of happiness, you say, well, these slum dwellers are happy, so we shouldn't do anything to them. But the capability approach goes beyond that and says, well, it's not because they report themselves as happy that they don't live in objectively um, bad situ bad situations. So the capability approach focuses very much on the objective conditions of life. And by the way, the reason for, for which um, the, ha the slum dwellers were, were happy is because they, were, they, uh, they had family relations and friends. And, um, and, and this is what, what brought the, the biggest sense of, of fulfillment. Even if they lived very poor lives, they tried to, but they developed mechanisms to cope with their lives and they put a high emphasis on relationships as opposed to, to other aspects of their lives where, where they were deprived. And then there's also the issue um, of, um, of uh, subjective aspects in, in, in health that, that um, indicates the limitations of the subjective approach to well-being. That people, the women, might say, yes, I'm fine, I, I, um, I, feel, I don't feel ill. But then when you look objectively at their, uh, their nutrition rate and anemic level, they suffer from anemia. But because they have adapted themselves say that, well, if I'm a woman, it's, it's normal that I feel weak, uh, so, so I'm, I'm fine. So there is a big difference between subjective evaluations of well-being and the objective evaluations of well-being. What um, in the literature is called adaptive preferences. People adapt themselves to their, to their situation, and they have, the slum dwellers have adapted to their poor conditions and try to make the most of, of their situation or the women have adapted themselves to the situation of being ill and they cannot even see that they are ill. So the capability approach is very much at the objective level. And so I come back to, um, to then the justice and reasoning, just to my last slide, about the liberal foundations of Sen. So the reason, one of the reasons for which Sen is so popular today, or so um, uncontroversial, is that he situates himself very much into the dominant liberal discourse of freedom. That, now if you recall the capability approach itself, is a freedom approach, it's about the freedom that people have to live a lively value. So he is not really disturbing the existing ideological order 
about freedom and, and, and liberalism. Hence why, hence why his ideas are so well received. So, coming back to the idea of justice, Freedom doesn't have only what he says opportunity aspect. Freedom is not only at the level of capabilities. Freedom is also at the process level. If you think about Cuba, when you say about Cuba, people are, are free to be healthy, they can have the good health that they want, they can be well educated if they want, but they don't have the process aspect of freedom. They are not involved in the process of decision making. So Cuba is not really seen as the example of human development. Even if they have good opportunities, good outcomes, there's not much in terms of process freedom. And this is why the idea of justice puts a lot of emphasis on democracy and public reasoning. It sees democracy much more than elections. Democracy is about public reasoning. And, um, and he emphasizes the importance of reasoning to overcome injustice. And he famously said that you know, there was no famine in a democracy. Because if people have this mechanism to protest against the government, then they will, they will be given the opportunities to live a life they value. And he gives the example of women's, of women's rights. Um, it is through public reasoning that women over, overcame the reason of man and that um, eventually they were given the same rights as man in, in many countries. Well, slavery is another example, he says, of reason overcoming unreason. By having this massive public debate about slavery, <coughs> eventually slavery was, um, was overcome through democratic process, through this process of public reason. Even if we, we can't have disagreement, he says, well, often disagreements are based on vested interests or, or, um, or prejudices. The, the women, the, the suffragettes in the 19th century, when they, they encountered a lot of opposition, they overcome, now, there was a lot of disagreement. M many men and, and women as well didn't agree on having equality between men and women. But eventually, you know, through a lot of reasoning, eventually people became convinced that yes, women had equal rights to men. They, they, were, they, 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 had, they, were, they were equal. Or the same about slavery, that it was a lot of opposition or vested interest, but eventually, if you persist in public reasoning, the unreason, this disagreement, will be overcome. And um, the idea of justice emphasizes as well that, well, in some cases, there, are, there, there can't be any agreement, but we can have partial agreement and, and move forward to that. You know, we, we, we don't agree about how to reduce poverty or how to reduce um, child malnutrition, but we can agree that if we have a program of school breakfasts, well, that will make the situation better. So, you know, we, we, we don't have partial agreements. So another example that I'm very familiar with in, in London about community organizing with different faith communities coming together. They disagree about their faith, they disagree about marriage, about homosexuality, abortion and everything. But they agree on the fact that, well, there is in, in the neighborhood, for example, there is a park that has been disused and then something needs to be done. So they, they have a, common, a commonality and that commonality is enough to generate collective action to do something about it. So that's for the idea of justice, and maybe I'll stop here one minute, just in case there are questions of clarification um, about the idea of justice. So freedom and reasoning, you see why freedom is so important, about the opportunity aspect, you know, that justice is about enabling people to be free, to live a life they value, and reasoning. It's through reasoning that we can reach that. So how to confront that to the reality? Well, the idea of justice is, the book, is surprisingly silent about real-life examples. And it uses this, um, this um, constructed example of a flute. And um, so you have a flute that has to be allocated between three children. One who has made it, 
one who has no toy and only a flute to play with, or a child that can play the flute? And then ask the question, to whom should the flute be distributed? If you give it to the one who plays the flute, well, the flute will be used to, to play music. But then what about the one who has no toy? Or what about the one who's made it? Doesn't he deserve to have the flute? And Sen doesn't really answer who should have the flute. All he says is that there, we have competing principles of justice. Should we redistribute according to merit? So the one who has made the flute? Should we distribute according to, um, to happiness, the one who has no toy? Or should we distribute it according to excellence, the one who plays the flute should, should have it? He says, well, there are competing principles, and that's, that's what democracy is about. Through reasoning, well, if we let, we let the three children talk to, to each other, they might find an agreement, and, um, and we don't know, but that's, that's what justice and, democ and democracy is about, he says. And I have to say that's as far as, as he goes to discussing the nitty-gritty aspects of justice. So he says that there's agreement about justice. But fortunately, in his works with Jean Dres, uh, uh, an Indian, Belgian origin economist, in the, um, they are a bit more explicit about how the capability approach can act as a theory of justice. And they give the example of food policy and malnutrition in India. Well, in India, 50% of children are malnourished, and the level of anemia among women is very high. But in India, there is also a large food surplus. And so they ask, why is it so? And so they say, well, justice demands first an evaluation in the capability space. And look at the situation. People are malnourished. And then they ask, well, why, why is it so? But the reason for, they call hunger amid plenty, is because farmers, the large-scale farmers, have a lot of polit political power. And they've been able to pass a law in, in, um, in the Indian um, state, at the, at the state level, to, to maintain an artificial uh, price for food, to make sure that the large-scale producers get a lot from their product, but then the consumers suffer. And the daily laborers and small farmers suffer from that food policy. And so they say, well, the solution to bring more justice, to enable people to be better nourished, is they say, to have more reasoning, to deepen democracy, is to increase the voice of the, the small farmers, to make them more organized, so that they can counter the voice of the most powerful. So it's an example of reason trying to overcome the injustice of the democratic system through reasoning, through political mobilization, can overcome the injustice of malnutrition. And um, Sen gives a, a very small example of the environment, but only three pages, um, about the importance of reasoning to overcome environmental destruction and to promote sustainability. And in many ways, the Copenhagen summit could be seen as a, an example of how the idea of justice works in practice. We have public reasoning, and we have a lot of reasoning about how to reduce carbon emissions. And we have a partial agreement. We don't know how to do it exactly, but we have an agreement that we need to reduce carbon emissions. And we make comparative judgments. We know that a situation with less carbon emission is better than another. But will that really do the job is another question. And I'd like to come back into the public policy example on Argentina. And how would you analyze them according to the idea of... So if you can think for a few minutes about how these policies have made the situation more just. And how do they conf how do they um, um, situate themselves within the framework of the idea of justice? If you think about the criteria of uh, food policy in India, and about evaluation, and then reasoning, how would they how how would you describe them? <coughs> 